in Kenya. She won the 2003 Kane Prize and is a past recipient of the Chevlin Sh Scholarship and an Iowa Writers Fellowship. In 2004, she was named Woman of the Year by Eve Magazine in Kenya for her contribution to the country's literature and arts. She was the executive, executive director of the Zanzibar International Film Festival from 2003 to 2005. She has also been a TEDx Nairobi speaker and a Lanan Foundation resident. Please jam me on together for her. <laughs> and to my right is Ayobami Adebayo, who was born in Lagos. Um, she holds a BA and MA degrees in literature in English from the Obafemi Aolo University, <laughs> um, where she also worked as an editor for Saraba magazine um, since 2009. I mean, she's still working as an editor in Saraba. Um, she also has an MA in creative writing from the University of East Anglia, where she was awarded an international bursary for creative writing. Ayobami has received fellowships and residencies from many places in the world, including Ebedi Hills. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to introduce the, 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 the books um, for you. For those who don't have it already, it's available. Okay, sorry. Apologies. This is the, the Nigerian ed, um, edition published by Wida Books um, and Dust. So these are the two books. They are available at the bookshop or the bookstore for those who need them. So let me just introduce the books. Um, so Dust um, is about something that happens in contemporary Nairobi when a young man, Moses Odidi Oganda, Leads, bleeds to death in the streets, murdered by the police. According to Tai Selassie in a review, she said, Dust concerns itself with Kenya's blood-soaked history from the Mau Mau uprisings of the early 1950s to the political assassination of Tom Boyer in 1969 to the post-election violence of 2007. Stay with me, on the other hand, is a portrait of a Nigerian marriage between Yewan Yejide and Akin Ajayi, who are not my relatives, <laughs> unraveling against the social and political turbulence of 1980s Nigeria. It is a devastating story of the fragility of married love, the um, wretchedness of grief, and the all-encompassing... I can't read my handwriting, I'm sorry. So um, I'll just go ahead to ask the questions. Um, I'm going to ask a few direct um, general questions to both authors. Um, and the first is this. You both have written wonderful, amazing first novels. And um, my question is, how, does, how do you as a writer deal with the, 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 the weight or the burden of critical and commercial acclaim, especially of a first work? Aya, would you go first? Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, how do you deal with it? Uh, it's still, I think it's still early days, actually. My book just came out in March. And um, I think the way I've dealt with it has been to step away from all of it as much as I can. My book came out in March and very quickly was reviewed by a lot of newspapers. And by the end of March, I simply stopped reading re reviews because I, whether they were good, most, I mean, the ones I'd read were very good. I found them a bit distracting from what I was doing, which was writing another book. So I just felt to myself, I'm not going to do this right now. I'm going to think about what I'm working on, and that's how I deal with it. Because who I am as a writer is what I wrote this morning. Um, that, that's, that's how I think about it, and that's how I choose to judge myself. Um, I mean, there's this famous Michi Katutanya <laughs> review which um, I'm saving for when I finish the next book. I haven't read it. When I finish the next book, that's my reward to myself to go and read that. So that's how I, I think very quickly I told myself, I can't, I can't, I can't take it, I just can't take in all of this. No. Interesting, I, I, I didn't know you hadn't read Michiko's review. Wow, I don't even think Michiko knows you haven't read her review. But Yvonne? Um, again, good. Afternoon, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here. This is my first visit to Nigeria and certainly to our book. Yeah, yeah. Actually, you shouldn't clap for me. It's, a, it's an overdue visit. You should say shame. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
how to deal with the uh, flash and the fabulousness of the kind of uh, uh, spectacular first launch is simply enjoy it. What I did, you know, you quickly enjoy it, but after a while you learn to stop believing the bullshit. It's so important to do that so that you can get on with the task at hand, which I Obama put very succinctly, which is actually get on with the next story. Um, but to also, I think, certainly allow, uh, certainly uh, to stop apologizing for the gifts that come with the moment and uh, to embrace it, but to do so, certainly for me, I had to learn to do so in moderation, <laughs> just so that I could get on with the next book. Thank you very much for that. Um, your book um, came into fame or came into acclaim, um, first as short story writers, um, I know Yvonne won the, the King Prize. Um, and Ayo, you actually wrote a short story that has similar themes with the, this, um, your novel. So how did you um, transition? How do you, how do you journey from being a short story writer to being a novelist? Um, what is lost? What is gained? What are the intricacies? What are the anxieties? I think that, um, so I had the idea for this book um, when I was in my final year in the university. And I was just too intimidated by the very idea of writing something as long as a novel. So I came to it with what I thought I could do. I wrote a short story um, that then metamorphosed into this. And um, in changing, in sort of working with the novel form, I, I just had to start doing it. I, I think that's, that's what happens at the end of you sit down and you do it. But what I did notice um, after I started writing Stay With Me was that I felt that the stories that I wrote became different. And, um, and I had to be very conscious uh, about the form of the short story itself and what it demands and how you need to leave much more left unspoken. And um, I think that that's what I honestly noticed uh, after I started working on the novel that I was reaching for length more and more, perhaps because I'd worked with such a wider canvas, I think. Okay, from short story to manuscript. When I wrote uh, Weight of Whispers, which was the first short, well, which is the first story I wrote, which won a prize, I wrote it in five days, primarily to get rid of uh, one of my friends, Binyavanga, who was calling me about five times a day for the story. Uh, but I thought that I would quickly transition into writing a novel. And since I wrote Weight of Whispers in five days, a novel would be what? At most two months? Well, seven years later. <laughs> uh, but a lot of that was uh, uh, learning, uh, le learning to be humble before the art, uh, before the story, uh, learning all sorts of things about the nature and character of story making. And, and the long form. I'm a bit of an impatient person and I got a sense of where the story should go, where the story was going to go. And uh, uh, since there's no uh, you know, uh, button to push uh, and the book emerges, one has to actually sit down and write the bloody thing. Um, that was a bit of a challenge. Wow, you're a bit of an impatient person. This book didn't strike me like it was written by someone impatient. Um, so we're going to just take readings um, from the book now. Okay. So we'll do reading from both books and then we'll ask some other questions. So Yvonne, a bit of context. Yeah. Um. Okay, since, uh, uh, since this festival is also a celebration of the feminine, I will read from the part where uh, a, a female character that I particularly like in this story, um, Akai Ma, um, appears on the scene and she's coming into the picture where her daughter, whom, who has been away for a long time, and her husband has come home with, uh, uh, with a coffin of her son, her really beloved son. She flows like magma every movement considered, as if it has come from the root of the world. Tall, willowy, wasp wasted, her breasts still large and firm, she is made of and colored by the earth itself. Something ferocious peers out of dark brown eyes, 
so that even in her most tender, even in, even her most tender glands, skulls, her voice, a bazoo-sounding gravel-colored afterthought, at pre at unpredictable moments, for nameless reasons. She might erupt with molten rock fury, belching fire that damaged everything it encountered. Akai was as dark, difficult, and dangerous as one of those few mountains where God shows up and just as mystifying. When he sees Akai, Nipir's hands pour sweat. Ajan's bags slip from his grip and tumble to the ground. Galgalu, carrying a lit kerosene lamp behind Akai, lifts her hand to Nyepir in greeting. But Nyepir's eyes are fixed on the bald patches on Akai Ma's scalp where she has torn out her hair. Scratches and tear marks on her face. Blood cakes her body in thin strips. One of Nyepir's AK-47s, the four kilogram 1952 with a wooden buttstock and hand guard is strapped to her body. Cradled in a green kanga with an, aphor with an aphorism written out on it. Nipir shambles towards his wife. He is preparing to steer away from the echoes of a, of a conversation that started one day in August 1998 after a distant living coward detonated a bomb in Nairobi. He should have known it was a forewarning. My son, Akaima had wailed at him then while a BBC radio news bulletin retold the story of an explosion in Nairobi. I want my son. He's safe, Nyepir had answered. Akai Lokorijem had said nothing, disappeared, reappeared, vaseline and fresh with a small bag ready for a journey. Now, now where are you going, Nyepir had asked, to find my son. Nyepir had granted, I'll go. Nyepir now inhales the orange sun, the dry grasslands and the chirping of early evening crickets to escape for even a second the horror of a story he must repeat to a mother. The roiling country, the murdered son. The fire in Galgalu's kerosene lamp wavers, Nyepir circles the area, hurries to shield Akai from seeing the coffin. Her mother, in Ajan, a concentration of absences from seven and a half years, twinge in her heart like a torn string, clanging lost music. She exhales and bounds over, an eager dog closing in on its mistress. Akaima pivots, another direction. Ajan stops. Nyepir stretches out his arm. Akai, he starts his explanation. Akai shoves him aside. He stumbles. She reaches the coffin. Wind hurls dust around a pair of creamy butterflies. Silence, soft-voiced. Who is it? Nyepir enters the breach. Our son, or Didi. He bows his head. Akai, Akai asks, who is it? Or Didi? Who? Akai, pleads Nyepir. No, she explodes. She glares at them all, paces up and down a portion of the field, her arms thrown up and then down. Then she returns and pinches Nipir's arm, her eyes sly. Where's my son? She won't wait for his reply. She returns to the coffin, clutching her waist, scratching her left arm. Mama, Ajan calls. Akai waves a hand at the noise. Nipir, where's my son? Nyepir's head swings left, right, left, right. I tried everything. I tried, he croaks, hands gesturing upward. Akai, Nyepir, I told you, bring my son home. Didn't you hear me? Nyepir's hands move upward again. His mouth opens and closes. Saliva clings to his jaw. Nyepir, where's my child? Akai's eyes bulge. Mama, stutters Ajan. Akai, Akai points at the coffin. Who? Galgalo moves closer. He props the lantern against the tree, uses his whole arm to wipe tears off his face. He had known it would come to this. He had known. Akai hobbles past. Show me. 
Galgalu unscrews the large bolts and opens the coffin lid. No time, no space. Akaima falls, arms stretched forward. She crawls, leans over Odidi's body, reaches in, takes it by the shoulders, holding him to her breast, keening in intermittent groans, lips on Odidi's forehead. She rocks her son, strokes his face, rocks her son. Odidi, she croons. Odidi, wake up. Son, listen. Obewesit, I'm calling you. To name something is to bring it to life. Wow. Um, for me, that was a very, very, very moving piece because, I mean, being a Yoruba person, you realize that, I mean, it's kind of forbidden for a mother or a parent to see the corpse of their kids. And, you know, reading this was, was quite moving. And I have a question about that, but let's take Ayo's reading. Um, so I'll be reading from a section a bit early on in the book. Um, the protagonist, Yeji Day, has been married for a number of years, but she doesn't have any children yet. And her husband's family has taken a second wife now, and she's gone to visit her mother-in-law. I believed I was mommy's favorite daughter-in-law. As a child, it was expected that I would call my stepmother's mommy. Even my father encouraged me to. But I refused. I stuck to calling them mama. And whenever my father was not around, some of the women would slap me just because I refused to honor them by calling them my mother. I did not refuse because I was being stubborn or trying to defy them, as a number of them concluded. My mother had become an obsession for me, a religion, and the very thought of referring to another woman as mother seemed sacrilegious, a betrayal of the woman who had given up her life for me to live. One year, the Anglican church my family attended celebrated Mothering Sunday with a special service. After the vicar delivered his sermon, he summoned everyone who was below the age of 18 to the front of the church because he wanted us to honor mothers with a song. I must have been 12 at the time, but I didn't get up until an usher poked me in the back. We sang a song that everyone already knew, an expansion of a popular saying. I managed the first line. Before biting my tongue to choke back tears, the words, mother is gold, mother is treasured gold that cannot be bought with money, resonated with me more than any homily I'd ever heard. I knew by then that my mother could not be replaced with money by a stepmother or anyone else. I was sure that I would never call another woman mommy. Yet, every time my mother-in-law wrapped me in a fleshy embrace, my heart sang, mommy. And when I called her the venerated title, it did not cling to my throat and refused to climb out the way it used to when my stepmothers tried to slap it out of me. She lived up to the name, taking my side if any issue I had with hacking came to her attention, assuring me that it was a matter of time before I got pregnant for her son, insisting that my miracle would be waiting once I turned the right corner. When Mrs. Adeolu, a pregnant customer told me about the mountain of jaw-dropping victory. I went to Mommy that same day to discuss it with her. I needed her to authenticate the information. She was a treasure house of knowledge about such things. Even if she did not know anything about the miracle house, she usually kno knew whom to ask. And once she had checked out the stories, she was always prepared to accompany me to the hands of the heart to seek a new solution. There was a time when I would have ignored Mrs. Adeolu's words, a time when I did not believe in prophets who lived on mountains or priests who worshipped beside rivers. That was, that was before I had so many tests done in the hospital, and every one of them showed 
that there was nothing preventing me from getting pregnant. I hoped at one point that the doctors would find something wrong, anything to explain why my period still showed up every month, years after my marriage. I wished they would find something they could treat or cut out. They found nothing. Akia also went in to get tested and came back saying that the doctors had found nothing wrong with him. Then I stopped waving aside my mother-in-law's suggestion, stopped thinking that women like her were uncivilized and a little crazy. I became open to alternatives. If I was not getting what I wanted in one place, what was wrong with searching elsewhere? My parents-in-law lived in Ayeso, an old section of town that still had a few mud houses. Their house was a brick building with a, low, with a front yard partially enclosed by a low cement fence. When I arrived at the house, mommy was sitting on a low stool in, fr in the front yard, shelling groundnuts into a rusty tree that sat on her lap. She looked up as I approached and looked down again. I swallowed and my steps slowed. There was something wrong. Mommy always greeted me by shouting, Yejide, my wife. The words were as warm as the embrace that usually followed them. Good evening, mommy. My knees trembled as they touched the concrete floor. Are you pregnant now? She said, without looking up from the tray of granite. I scratched my head. Are you barren and deaf too? I say, are you pregnant? The answer is either yes, I am pregnant, or no, I still haven't been pregnant for a single day in my life. I don't know. I stood up and backed away until she was not within the reach of my clenched fist. Why won't you allow my son to have a child? She slapped the tray of granite on the floor and stood up. I don't manufacture children, God does. She marched towards me and spoke when her toes were touching the tips of my shoes. Have you ever seen God in a labor ward giving birth to a child? Tell me, Yejide, have you ever seen God in the labor ward? Women manufacture children, and if you can't, you're just a man. Nobody should call you a woman. She gripped my wrists and lowered her voice to a whisper. This life is not difficult, Yejide. If you cannot have children, allow my son to have some with for me. See. We are not asking you to stand up from your place in his life. We're just saying you should shift so that someone else can sit down. I am not stopping him, mommy, I said. I have accepted her. She even spends the weekends in our house now. She held her thick waist and laughed. I'm a woman too. Do you think I was born last night? Tell me, why has Haki never touched for me? He has been married to her for over two months. Tell me why he has not removed the wrapper once. Tell me, Yejide. I stifled a smile. It's not my business what Akin does with his wife. Mommy lifted my blouse and laid a wrinkled palm on my stomach. Flat as the side of a wall, she said. You've had my son between your legs for two more months and still your stomach is flat. Close your thighs to him, I beg you. We all know how he feels about you. If you don't chase him away, he won't touch for me. If you don't, he will die childless. I beg you, don't spoil my life. He's my first son, Yejide. I beg you in the name of God. I closed my eyes, but tears still pressed their way past my eyelids. Mommy sighed. I have been good to you. I beg you in the name of God, Yejide. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. She held me then, pulled me into her arms and muttered words of comfort. I embrace held no warmth. Her words sat in my stomach, cold and hard, where her baby should have been. Wow. Are you lucky? You didn't tell me that you are going to do, you're a singer like that, man. When I when you see the coming out. Okay, well, um, while you were reading, um, in a sense, you were reading in English, but I was hearing Yoruba. I don't know if anybody in the audience who is Yoruba, how did you come about that? Like, how are you able to use language such powerfully like that? I mean, are you able to transmute it? Like, Thank you for the compliment. Um, 
How? Um, repeated failure. That, that, that's simply how it is. Um, with this particular book, and each story, each book, I think, determines sort of as, as a way that it determines the way it will be told. And with this one, with the setting, with the people, I felt that I wanted to do something with the language that reflected that on the page. And it was basically doing it over and over again and throwing out things that I wasn't satisfied with. And also being willing to have some things lost in translation, you know, knowing that um, there are readers from other parts of the world who might not pick up some of the nuances that would be obvious to someone who's Nigerian, but I felt that, okay, somewhere else in the story, they'll get the gist, you know. And still about language, Yvonne. Um, your book is written in such lush prose. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to even call you a poet, as it were. I mean, even though you're a novelist, I, I don't know if you've ever written poetry. Um, but more importantly, it's about what you, what you wrote about language. Um, in your book, you said that um, there are the official languages of, of Kenya is English, Kiswahili, silence, and memory. And in a sense, reading Dust, um, I felt like it, it felt was like midway between interrogating silence and invoking memory. Can you speak to this? Uh, invoking silence, what, what invoking memory? Yeah. Uh, uh, and interrogating silences. Well, I, I imagine that there are so many ways of communicating. And I think earlier, the earlier panel was talking about shame and language. Um, and there, uh, there's, a common al uh, there's a common thread about the way we deal with uh, uh, violations, especially of the intimate, personal kind. And when I mean intimate and personal, the violations a country visits on its own people. Uh, is a part of the pattern of the um, intimate and personal um, violence that also seem to produce shame, right? And sometimes, uh, and certainly with reference to the Kenya I was talking about, I remember growing up in the time of uh, extreme madness by the state, um, I was struck by the... Uh, return to silences, the things that are not said. Uh, uh, and even though they're not said, everybody is aware of what is actually happening. And again, with reference to that Kenya state, what also strikes me is that the assumption by the state eager to erase a particular narrative, a particular happening, a particular, say, for example, genocide, even though it will disappear from the face of, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, the national story or even in the media, uh, in our case, like 50 years later, everything has kind of emerged, and it's a fascinating moment in Kenya right now because, uh, certainly as a writer who's curious about memory, I start to ask, where did the memory hide? Uh, and uh, there are things that are emerging that I'd assume people had forgotten and that are being languaged again, yet where had they gone in these last 50 years? Because there's no word, no sentence, no, wor no uh, not even a phrase um, that made reference to that particular happening. But they're here and they're now and they're being listed uh, one after another. So I think that, uh, that, was, that, that was the part of the, in both the interrogation but and, and the invocation of the idea that um, there are ways of speaking that are not necessarily uh, what we assu assume speaking to be. And something, something interesting happened recently. Uh, Kenya had um, an elections this year, um, and you know your, your book came out in 2013 when Kenya was celebrating its 50th um, anniversary of independence of our independence. Um, what are your thoughts? Like, really, it's. It, 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 there was so much drama about it also. I mean, this particular election. Uh, you, you ask about the current election. Uh, ah. Um, if I'm being mean, the current election is a continuation of all the elections that we had uh, not really completed in the past. And it's an ongoing narrative that had been put on pause. There's been no election that has been complete. And this, is, this, this particular situation right now is simply the collapse of a lot of the illusions and delusions we had constructed to pretend that elections were actually taking place. 
Um, and let's see, something, uh, it's in a place, it, we're in a state of flux right now. Uh, there are all sorts of uh, uh, eruptions um, occurring. Um, and uh, some of the Kenyans will, uh, I got some information from one of my Kenya-based friends, who's right here, Zukiswa, who's telling me about the, the sense of uh, both surprise, but em uh, empowerment of a country that has decided to perform a boycott, a national boycott. It's never happened before. So uh, wh what can I say? The election is still in the process of unfolding. <laughs> you, uh, your, um, your book is a very personal story of a marriage disintegrating, but also it's against the backdrop of the 80s Nigeria, and we all know what the 80s means. I mean, military incursions, um, assassinations of the likes of Billy Gua. Um, and my, my question really is, um, I, I, I was, I'm interested in your choices as, as in why did you choose the 80s as opposed to the 90s? Because I, I seem to find similarities with it. I mean, the 80s and 90s, was, it was essentially a continuum of military um, dictatorship. But I mean, if you have someone like Dele Giwa who was assassinated in, um, in the 80s and it was, you know, nobody really knew what really went wrong. There was a cancer river that was actually killed, you know. I'm, I'm interested in your choices. Why did you make those choices? Okay, um, before I answer the question, a digression, my personal, personal obsession. The Nigerian um, House of Rep is still saying that um, Kansar was dead as of two days ago. They're still saying that it was a lawful execution. So, um, yeah, that's very interesting to think about in terms of where we've come as a country and how far we've come. But I think um, I, want, I was interested in the 80s because I think it was a very interesting moment. Um, what was to come in the 90s was, of course, a follow-up. But in the 80s, we, we had something very significant, I think, happen. And I mean, language matters, and, and it's powerful. So we had a military dictator who essentially started calling himself a president. You know, I mean, he just phoned the title, no elections, nothing. And you know, and it was all of a sudden President Babangida. And I think that um, even if you read the interactions that people still had, I think it was, it, was, it was a moment in that in some ways, I mean, we had had military governments before, but it was different in terms of the fact that all the people that had come before were apologetic about being there. Yeah. It was we're here temporarily, and we all know that democracy is the best thing, and we're going to get out. This was someone who was trying to push a narrative that somebody can basically hijack power and somehow legitimize that, that fact. So that's one of the reasons why I was interested. I feel like there was a, a shift in that time uh, in terms of how we engage with the country as citizens. If you look at, um, say, with the Vats Vatsa coup and when Vatsa was going to be executed, you still had many people going to, Abut to, go into Babangida rather, to, um, you had writers and um, coming account. together yeah. and saying, we're going to talk. I mean, now, I don't think anybody would have taught in 1996 that you could reason, mm. you know, with um, whoever was in power because events like that made us to realize, I think, that the people who were in power did not see us as citizens. It, it was really that simple. And I feel like, Many of those things still carry on now. The, the way that our lives change, our engagements with the government, even the way most Nigerian middle class people, including the couple in this novel, try to insulate themselves from the insanity that's going on. So there's armed robbery, you build a higher fence. I mean, I mean, that's just what you do. And that's what they do here. And even if you look at the architecture, you see houses that were built before that time. There's just a low fence, like I read. And then all of a sudden, there are these fences that nobody can see what's inside the house. So I feel like it was an important moment. And I was just, yes, I'm obviously very interested in it. Uh, very nice. Um, still on, on the politics, and I don't know how we go here. Um, Yvonne, you, you wrote about Fela um, in the early pages. Moses, um, the character or the protagonist who, who died in the, in the beginning or before the book began. Um, was, you know, it was singing or it was, it was theorizing or, you know, thinking about Fela, um, Fela's music and, and quite incidentally, you, you happen to be in Fela's hometown. Um, yeah, and um, I, I knew that you would want to, s you have one or two things to say about where well, Fela won and then also two about this Fela song called Teacher Don't Teach Me Nonsense, which is actually Fela 
saying that, well, all these things, all these failures of former colonies, of wh whatever colonial masters, all these failures are basically a legacy of that co uh, colonization. I, I don't know if you want to speak to that. Wow. Um, th that's tough. That's a tough one. <laughs> but it's, it's not the... F I, I, I don't entirely agree that it's necessarily a... a it's fully a failure. Or I, I mean, the failures and the crisis a lot of our countries, our post-independent nations encounter are because of necessarily the colonial legacy. I think the more painful legacy is uh, the one we prefer not to talk about, the one that dares not speak its name, is the post-colonial betrayal, the betrayal of the post-colonial nation of our dreams, our aspirations. Um, it, is, it is more painful and more shameful to say that, uh, to acknowledge the fact that um, uh, the, our, our, our dreams had been broken by our own. You understand? And uh, to, to grieve the loss, to grieve the, the b and it's a very intimate and terrible betrayal um, by those whom we had once believed would uh, carry, the f uh, carry our flags um, to, to, the, to the greatest of heights and, in and, and instead have dug increasing pit, bigger and bigger pits for us where they not only bury our dreams but disappear our bodies uh, and then run another election in which they can repeat the pattern. And then we, we also collude with a si we collude in silence because it's, it's shameful, isn't it? And I, I'm glad I can say that here. Yeah, it is shameful. Mm. Uh, and it hurts. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm sure the audience um, have questions. At this point, we're going to take questions. We need a roving mic. Um, please keep your questions as questions and p keep your comments short. Thank you. Um, the lady there, please can you pass the mic on to her? Um, okay. The man in black and the other man there. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be... Oh, and then you, yourself. Thank you. Um, so we'll answer those questions, and then we'll see if we can still, still take some more. Your name, uh, good and if you can good stand. Good evening. Nice. My, my name is um, Abuba Kaributi. My question is um, to, to Ayo. So um, some months back, we were discussing uh, your book at a club in Kaduna. So um, there was a debate that uh, erupted. We are unable to reconcile the fact that uh, somebody like your <laughs> I am not no sure spoilers. it's going to be a, a spoiler per se, but um, I just want to say that um, the conflict of the book, which is the fact that uh, a man is unable to impregnate his wife, what we are, we are unable to reconcile is... Uh <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm, I'm sorry about that, but um, just it ask has a to be question. Asked. Yeah. Okay, we're unable to reconcile the fact that um, a woman like um, Yejire. Naivety. Like yes, yes, the naivety. How could somebody like um, Yejire be that uh, naive? <laughs> yeah. So I, I understand your question. I've gotten it before. Yeah. Sure, okay. So, so I'll just take. Let's it take quickly. the questions, then we'll take answers. Oh, okay. Um, another question. Yeah, from um, Bio. Bio. What happened to the lady here with the question? Okay, please, I need the mic to her too. Okay. But I ask your question, please. Okay, well, um, I think the question will go to both of them. I'm just, um, I want to ask about memory. And uh, thank God Vaughn mentioned something about um, people trying to wipe, uh, p uh, like politicians or leaders trying to recreate society in their own image by wiping out the memory. So what roles do both of you think, you know, especially with the kind of books you've written, especially Vaughn now, what roles do you think writers can play? Or do you think writers are actually doing enough, first of all, to make sure society, so that this memory is not wiped out? Like, mm. these people don't succeed in recreating this in their own image. And then, if, whether you think they're doing right or not, what do you think writers or people who are interested in literature can actually be doing in that regard? That's the question. Thank you very well, much. Thank you. The question, um, please, okay. To the lady um, in... 
In green, yeah. Green and yellow. Okay, that's all. I've read the two books. I've read Yvonne's Dust and I've read Obama's Stay With Me. And they're two different books in the sense that for me, Dust was, we already knew the end and it was more about the journey. And then with Ayobami, I was so, so anxious about getting to the end of the book because I had my own ending in mind. And so <laughs> my question is, when you're writing and you're setting the style for your book, for the two authors, do you say, I want my reader to enjoy this journey, to enjoy the language, to just, you know, take it piece by piece? Because the truth is, I haven't finished Yvonne's Dust because it's a very heavy book and the language you, I just want to enjoy every piece of poetry in it, like Thai Selassie's Ghana must go. But with Ayobamia, I, was, I really was rushing through it like a speed train, wanting to get to the end and get to the climax of the book. But how do you set the tone for your book before you even start writing it in terms of style? So, so thank you very much. So we'll take the answers. Um, I, uh, okay, okay, um, okay, yes, um, a question. Let's take that and we'll take all the answers. Um, I hope you have enough time. Hi, um, I was hoping, this is for both of you, I was hoping that you could talk about um, uh, how you feel about the reactions to your book in different parts of the world. Um, so maybe how the reaction has been different. I'm curious, particularly in the West, because I'm from there. Um, but how, how do you respond to the reactions to your books in um, other countries versus your home countries? Would you go first and answer the question? Mm -hmm. We have more. So, um, I'll s For now, let's okay. just answer those questions and see if we have more time. So I'll start with the gentleman. Um, so if you've read the novel, um, you'll understand what I'm saying. If you've not, it's reason to buy it. Um, the question of naivety, um, there th I think there are three parts to it. There's the, quest there's the reality that she's, she's also a bit naive, at least in the beginning of the relationship you have to understand what her background is. She's someone who has um, grown up without the very important network of women that um, are essential in your life as, as a girl child um, in this part of the world because that's where you get all your education from. Nobody's going to talk to you about these things in school. We don't have um, room for that. And then there's also, after a point, there's the question of denial. So after a point, it's not that she doesn't know on some level what's going on, it's that she's not willing to look at it or face the consequences of looking at it and admitting to herself that this wasn't going on. Because when you name uh, s something, when someone who's close to you betrays you, um, a kind of intimate betrayal, there's a sense in which you internalize, um, you internalize what has happened and you feel that they hold these questions that you might not be ready to deal with. So it's, it's not just one motivation. There's the naivety and there's the fact that I think that I, I might speak for many people that are just certain things in our lives that we, we're not ready to confront and therefore we go on and just go on. It's not that we're not aware on a level we know, but we're just not ready for that. So I hope that takes care of that. Uh, on the question of memory and the roles of writers, um, in terms of memory, I guess that one of the things that could be done is to write these things into being, you know. Um, I think that that's one thing you can do as a writer if that is what you care about. And as much as I care about this subject, uh, I'm, I'm very um, wary of telling writers, this is your duty. You have to write this. Um, I think that writers, your job is to write the story that you care about. It might be political, it might not you know, that, that's your job um, and that's your description. But if you are someone who cares about it, then one of the things you can do is do the research, get to know these things, ask questions, get the books, go to places, um, and write it into being in whatever way you can. Um, okay, what do you think about when you're writing? It depends on the book. It depends on the story. It depends on... It changes from time to time. Um, there are things that I've written that it's not even about the story. I, I tell you what has happened at the beginning. So, you know, it's about how, why and how did we get here. So e each book, uh, that's the sense I have with my own writing, each book, each story. It's, it's a process of discovering the voice that is necessary, the way the story 
demands in a sense to be told. I hope that makes some sense to someone. And uh, yeah, and um, how do I feel feeling about reactions to okay reactions to the book in different countries? Um, I'm not sure if it's been very different. I feel like, but I, I do feel that what I have been astonished by, and I have to I have to say this, is how very warmly many Nigerians have received this novel. Thank you very much. Everywhere I go, I mean, there's always, there's always Nigerians in the room, and I, 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 I mean, I, I love Nigerians, but this experience has been exceptional. So I, I don't think it's been very different. Uh, there, there have been a few quite weird questions that I've gotten from people where I'm like, well, that's not the point of my book, you know, but um, maybe in the West and where people are sort of very interested in talking about the anthropological aspects of the book. And it's just, I'm like, I'm sorry, that's, 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 not, the, um, that's not what, that's not my point. But it hasn't been as much, uh, there's a sense in which you are dreading that kind of response, but it hasn't been so much, to be honest. I, I would answer the question less as a writer and more as an artist. And the, the, there's a role of the artist that we don't quite, uh, the character of the artist that, um, it's not necessarily greatly emphasized in a lot of places, that of witness and as a witness to the human experience. Uh, uh, all sorts of things are hidden in the message of the artist, whether in song or art or, or in the stories that we tell. Um, I don't think memory, memory has so many ways. Memory is creative. It finds no, so many ways to um, keep itself uh, memorable. <laughs> um, yeah, and so whatever the politicians do, uh, they will never get away with it. There's always something or some, there's always a record of that somewhere. Um, about uh, uh, the story and style, uh, as Iobam puts it, um, very much the story tells you what it wants. I, I, I wrote a very, my first version, my first draft of Dust was under another name, was a completely different story than that which emerged and it was all wrong. Um, so I had to embrace what emerged, whether I liked it or not. Um, uh, about reaction, it's very interesting. When the book Dust was launched uh, in Kenya, uh, there's a special launch in Kenya, it kind, of it kind of divided people according to political inclination. There are those who loved it and there were those who loathed it. Um, but the best reaction for me has been from a new generation, a younger generation who have been, who have been referring to the text um, as a way of looking at their own country again. Um, the other reaction, and I think the best reaction was meeting a, a, a young man on the streets of Nairobi. I was minding my own business and he comes up to me and says, you're the author of Dust? I say, yes. And then he says, uh, I, I was waiting to hear all those lovely things that one ought to hear. And he says, on page 23, there's a mistake. On page 48, <laughs> on page 48, you drop the character. <laughs> and he showed me his book where he had lined up. I went, <laughs> and it's kind of, kind of rewarding as well. Um, but again, because it's been translated, it's been, I, I'm again all, I'm overwhelmed by the sense of, and the power of a story, finding its own life and its own people. Uh, I've been touched by especially the German reaction uh, they're behaving as if the book was never written in English and, uh, and using it to interrogate in many places where I, I, I travel in, G in German society, they use the book to look at their own histories rather than look at Kenyan histories. It's, I mean, I think, I, I think very much about reaction. <laughs> yeah. A, a, a story is its own thing. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Story its own thing. Um, I have one question for both of you, and I must ask this question because I have many questions I'm not asking. What is the human cost of writing a novel? I mean, uh, of sitting with these characters, of imagining them into being, and then having to live through their experiences vicariously. How do you do it? Okay, you have a mic. Uh, you go for it. Um. Hmm. Also, um, it depends on the story. Uh, with this novel, it was it was a bit 
it was quite difficult, to be very honest. And I think one of the reasons why it took so long was that at some point, I, I, never want, I didn't want to go back to Yejide's story because it was so painful to inhabit uh, this woman's perspective and all of the tragedy that happens to her. I remember there was a time when I was working on my, when I was on, on the HEMI program and the creative writing Emmy, and I'd been writing all day and it was summer and it, so it was still bright outside around nine and I just had to walk and I was, I was walking and I re realized that I didn't know where I was anymore and then I had to find my way back with Google Maps. So it can be difficult, you know, to, to do this. Uh, but I mean, I, I don't like to complain about it. It's what she chose to do. And um, one of the things that's been gratifying, um, okay, I'll talk about, there's a scene in the book that it went through several drafts. If you've read it, it's where Yedide goes up on a mountain. And it was there right from the very beginning. And every time I came back to that novel, I kept asking myself, why is this here? I mean, it was one of the things I struggled with because I, I didn't want to experience it without every time I had to rewrite it. And um, a couple of, a, a while ago, someone got in touch with me who had read the book and said, oh, I gave my mother this book. And she said to me, and we, we talked for about five hours about this kind of things. And she told me how her friend had experienced exactly the same thing. And I felt like, yes, that's why it had to be in the book, because this experience, these things do happen, and um, we need to see them, we need to uh, face them. So I, I feel like there's a cost if, if you want to get in there with the characters, but I, I, I feel like with this one, I mean, with that conversation, I felt like, yes, it was worth it. Okay, the human cost, uh, actually. Uh, well, I think I'll deal, how would I answer this question? The, the human cause that comes to mind is the fact that a lot of my friends now look at me sideways because they know I'm listening in and they know that none of their experiences will go wasted. <laughs> and uh, sometimes, and uh, there's a part of you that kind of kicks in and, uh, uh, you know, uh, I hope it doesn't sound too callous, you know, some of a friend experiencing was going through a horrible time in a, re a relationship breakup and I'm deeply sympathetic and I love this person so dearly but there's a part of me that's saying yes okay and that's the emotion <laughs> that's the reaction what a lovely word <laughs> this is how to say shit okay <laughs> so there's that <laughs> one leaves with it yeah, thank you very much. with that we've come to the end of the book chat please jam your hand together um,